What? <laughs> Why is he putting an IO in into that clown? Hello, welcome back to the channel. My name's Ed, your friendly neighborhood emergency doctor, and we're continuing our look at the pit. So here it is, episode 13. All in SWAT. Just a precaution, they still haven't found the shooter yet. They need to stay out there, not in here. Officer down, you know the drill. 16 gauge in the right AC. <laughs> when they said uh, 16 gauge there, I thought for a minute, are they able to identify the kind of shotgun that was used. But of course, when they say 16 gauge in the right AC, they're talking about a 16 gauge cannula. So IV access, we use the term gauge to determine how big it is. 16 gauge is a pretty big one. And the right AC, they're talking about the anti-cubital fossa. So the inside of your elbow, fossa meaning a shallow cave. So in trauma, we wanna be able to resuscitate people quickly. So you want nice big cannula, and yeah, you've got some big juicy veins in that area. So you've got the cephalic and your basilic vein connected up by the median cubital vein. What's up with the SWAT team? Maybe they think the shooter's coming here? Shit, is that true? What? My kid's in the break room. Jesus Christ. I mean, hopefully this is just a precaution and not some kind of bad omen. It's really not unusual for us to have law enforcement in the hospital. Usually it's bringing patients in that are in custody, that are unwell or have been injured in the situation that have led to their arrest, but never had a SWAT team due to a potential threat on the hospital. I mean, as if this situation isn't hard enough. I can't see the cords. Let's bag him. Sorry, I'm used to the glide scope. Spoiled by technology. Yeah, so they're trying to intubate the patient here. We mentioned in the last video, that he's got a gunshot wound to the face and neck, so his airway is at risk of becoming blocked from the bleeding and swelling, so they wanna get a definitive airway, so a tube down his trachea. And they failed on the first attempt here, in part because they usually have access to a video laryngoscope, and because the patient is sedated, all that time they were trying to intubate, his oxygen would be going down. So at some point, you have to abort the attempt and oxygenate him with a bag valve mask to get his oxygen levels up to try a fresh attempt. So that's why she says, we're gonna have to go bag him again. Spoiled by technology. Danny, you got a bougie back there? Cool, so on this second attempt, they're gonna use a bougie. Now this doesn't refer to the doctors just having fancy taste, but rather a bougie is a long flexible rubber stick with a kink in the end called the coup de tip, which is French for elbow, lots of, uh, elbow references in so far. And it's this tip that helps you feel the way into the trachea. So then the end of tracheal tube can be placed over the top with the bougie removed to secure the airway. Hi, I'm Dr. King. Buster Pirelli. I take it you're a children's entertainer? Impressive observational skills. <laughs> no active bleeding. <laughs> Love that. Yeah, these kind of humorous bits are clearly written to help break up the intensity of the situation. But in real life, you do get elements of strange and funny things that just peek through the bleakness. No active bleeding. Um, can you tell me your pain on a scale of one to 10? At least a three. And can you wiggle your fingers? Uh -huh. Cool, so we saw the doctor ask the patient for a pain scale from one to 10. And yet we use this in medicine all the time. Obviously, it's very subjective, but it can be a really good way of understanding how pain is developing over time. And from someone who's had a slip disc in my neck before, and my pain was insane, I know how you can have pain of like eight out of 10 and kind of not really show it. This guy's all good. Okay, you're gonna feel a little pinprick here. Ah! What? Me! <laughs> Why is he putting an IO in? into that clown. This patient is pretty stable, so you could easily get away with an IV cannula here. For example, they just put an IV in that police officer with a facial injury, so why, why are they drilling into this guy? You might even argue that it's a superficial wound with no vascular injury, and so could he manage with just oral antibiotics? If the patient is awake and alert, it's just a standard IV, not an IO. Unless it's a mime, they can't scream. <laughs> We all make what we think are stupid mistakes when we're learning. I remember when I was first taking blood as a medical student, I had to take a CRP, renal function, liver function, and a bone profile for the same patient. And on the request form, it looked like four separate vials of blood. I didn't know you could just send one vial for all those tests. So I took four vials of blood plus one vial for a full blood count. And I proudly came back to the doctor supervising me and they just looked at me and went, Jesus Christ, 
does the patient have any blood left? And I, <laughs> and I felt so bad. But actually, five vials of blood is still perfectly safe. But yeah, you just feel like an absolute idiot as Whitaker does here. I also <laughs> heard from a consultant that I respected a lot that he did his first PR exam, so an examination of the back passage, without any gloves on. So yeah, even the top doctors have moments in their career that they can cringe back on. No, nothing. I'm not seeing anything. Okay. This bag, I'm gonna prep the neck. You don't have a bougie. I have an 11 blade and a Okay, prayer. I mean... It wouldn't be the most sterile technique, but couldn't they just reuse a bougie? It's just a piece of rubber, so just wipe it down with a sterile wipe. Okay, it's <laughs> terrible from an infection prevention point of view because it's been in someone else's throat, but they're trying to save this dude's life. And these are kind of desperate situations. A uh, tactical airway in my bag here. What is that? It's a control crate kit. Oh, that's perfect. Yes, sir. Okay, let's go to the tracheal rings, good. Bob's your uncle. That was incredibly fast. Wow. Balloon is up. That is a super fast cricothyroidotomy. He's using a tactical airway from a battlefield medical kit, which is pretty appropriate as, you know, we're kind of seeing battlefield medicine here rather than the medicine I'm used to. Well, we covered this procedure before in episode two, so an emergency surgical airway through the cricothyroid membrane. So after a few attempts at intubation, you have to know when to fail and go for another option. This is a very difficult airway given this guy's injuries. And they made the cricothyroidotomy look incredibly easy. I've only ever done it in training on a pig carcass, never in real life, but I've been told that from the bleeding, it can be incredibly challenging. Yellow and entitled. Yeah, right. And we see exactly what we want to. Um, the caponography here turning yellow. This is a filter that detects carbon dioxide. So it tells us the tube is correctly in the trachea as we're getting carbon dioxide, which is only going to be produced from gas exchange in the lungs. This is important to check because the worry with all intubation is that you've gone into the esophagus, so the food pipe. And in that circumstance, you wouldn't get any carbon dioxide. You'd just get the same air back that you blew in. Now, man, I mean, what is going on in the world when you've got people that have to worry about being shot just doing your job? I mean, clearly, in this circumstance, the guy's delirious from hemorrhagic shock and doesn't know what he's doing. Bailed IO, guy's huge. Needle won't reach the bone. He needs induction meds and blood. Guy needs access, but the IO won't reach the humerus. Proximal tibia? Yeah, he's a big chap. So an IO in the humerus isn't going to cut it. So they're going to have to go on the tibia, so on the shin bone. And you can feel where we'd go on you yourself. You feel that little bony prominence called the tibial tuberosity right at the top of the shin bone. You go two centimeters medially. So two centimeters on the inside of the shin bone on a nice flat bit and that's where we drill in. You might not want to feel that in yourself when thinking about drilling it. it might make you feel a little bit queasy. And this is a great place to go because you know you don't get a lot of fat on your shins. Uh, but one of the downsides is, is you're not going to be able to infuse quite as quickly as you would in your humerus. But you can mitigate that somewhat by pressurizing the bag to drive the fluid through. Tibia is not great access. You can only get a liter an hour down there. You get what you get. Cool, yeah. As we said, nice little bit of uh, medical info there. No pulse, start compressions. Okay, get him up. Get him back with two liters. That is as much as we can afford per patient. So this chap here uh, arrests while they're trying to intubate him. So they're gonna squeeze a load of blood into him and start CPR. They have a high suspicion he has arrested from hemorrhagic shock, so loss of blood, hence they're giving him blood. But there's also the potential in trauma to cause a cardiac tamponade, so bleeding around the heart or a tension pneumothorax, so expanding air around the lungs. So a bedside ultrasound would be super useful to help diagnose these reversible causes of cardiac arrest. Vincent had a gunshot to the head. When he arrived here, there was no pulse or breathing. My husband is dead. You're so sorry. sorry. Oh man, so, so sad. And 
yeah, we get a lot of training on this um, breaking bad news in general, but you know, it still doesn't make it any easier. I think they do a decent job. We are taught to give a warning shot, so a phrase that helps people prepare a little bit for what they're about to hear. And they lead with Vincent's got a gunshot wound to the head and now he's not breathing. For me, that's a little bit too technical and too much detail because she may think he's in a coma. In fact, she does say here, is my husband dead? So has left her with a bit of confusion. I would open with, I'm really sorry. I have some bad news. Give her a second and then say, Vincent is dead. Much clearer and then you can assess whether she wants any further details after that. A four back here. Oh my word. They're just coming in on, on trucks now. There, there was so much blood, I tried to stop it. Jake? Robbie, Leah got shot, it's really bad. Oh my word. This just makes it like 10 times worse. Inevitably you end up treating people you know. If you can, you need to avoid it if there's another doctor available, but sometimes it's just not possible. Or maybe if someone works in the hospital, everyone would know them. And it does come with some additional anxiety because of that personal connection. And I mean, in this situation as well, like, can you get any more anxiety? No, he's sleeping. Keep going. No response to pain. Shit. Yeah, Mr. Grayson. Just go get an attending. I'll try, but no promises. Excuse me. I think I'm still bleeding. I'll be with you in a minute. The team are just absolutely swamped now. I think that initial rush of adrenaline and energy is just sort of giving way to the, the absolute wave of complex patients that are presenting. You can get to a point where you are so cognitively overloaded that you aren't becoming more efficient. You just grind to a halt. In actual fact, what we have here is actually pretty simple, but it's only simple kind of when you're not in that situation. That's why it's so important to reflect back on your performance as a doctor as things are so much harder in the moment. So the team have all been drawn into this old man who's dropped his GCS. They've all been sort of task fixated on getting this thing sorted when actually just one of them needs to do an A to E assessment on him. As we saw in the last episode, he may have something simple wrong with him, like a low blood sugar and that would free up someone else to continue to be able to put pressure on that woman who's bleeding. You need the second line? We're gonna have and platelets. You sure, Robin? So if we get the plasma, I'm gonna take over compressions and swap. So Dr. Robbie is pulling out all the stops on his stepson's girlfriend, basically giving her preferential treatment. Uh, so you probably have mixed feelings about this because this is the type of stuff that can really get you in serious trouble as a doctor, but also you can totally understand why he's doing it. We see he's using a cell saver. So this is a machine that recycles blood you have lost to transfuse it back into you, in this case from her hemothorax, so the blood from her chest. It's a pretty cool piece of kit, but it's generally only used in surgical operations where we expect a lot of blood loss. For detachment? For intracranial pressure by measuring the optic nerve sheath, which is, holy shit, 10 millimeters. Here it is. We see our favorite butterfly ultrasound and we find out the old hippie dude has got an intracranial bleed, likely an epidural bleed. So blood building up inside the skull, squashing his brain. This is why CT head scans are so useful in patients with significant head trauma to rule these type of bleeds out. And also why it's also important if people don't fit the criteria for a CT head that they also have someone with them for a period of observation. The brain and the eye have an intricate relationship as the optic nerve is essentially an extension of the brain. So as the pressure increases inside the skull, you'll get a bulging or swelling of the optic nerve at the back of the eye and that's what they're seeing on this ultrasound. So this guy really needs an urgent craniotomy. So a hole drilled in his head to evacuate the blood Otherwise the pressure will continue to rise and squash the brain out the bottom of the skull, which would kill him. A 10 cc syringe. Well, should we intubate, hyperventilate? Anatol decreases ICP. Holy shit! <laughs> I mean, Whitaker 
said it exactly like I would. Fair play though, she's making some big decisions. I just wonder if it was worth waiting a few minutes to see if a neurosurgeon could come down and take a look, but she's taking matters into her own hands. She got a pulse back after three pack cells, 600 of the cell saver, two of FFP. I'm not feeling it. Oh, mate. So. Okay, get another unit. It's got platelets and plasma. It'll help her clot. Got it. So they're giving her platelets and FFP too. So that stands for fresh frozen plasma. So your blood isn't just red blood cells, you know, the donut cells that carry your oxygen. It also contains plasma. So the liquid part that contains, amongst other things, proteins that are involved in the clotting cascade that make this fibrin mesh during clotting and also platelets. So small fragments of larger cells that then plug up this fibrin mesh to form a clot. So by giving her these blood products, the aim is that it will help any bleeding going on. Bullet tore through her heart. Anyone else with a wound like this is pronounced dead in the field. You can't keep up with the blood loss. Oh man, so Dr. Abba is having to help Robbie with you know, his situational awareness here. The patient likely has a ventricular rupture, so a bullet right through the heart chamber. And as he said, a pretty poor survival rate in normal circumstances, let alone in this situation. We're gonna lose 10 other patients if you put all your efforts into saving this girl. And there it is. I mean, that's the reality. Impossible decision for Dr. Robbie to make, but I think Dr. Abbott needs to help him out and make that decision for him. Maybe we're seeing a bit of authority bias, so he's maybe scared to talk to him because of his position. I mean, if it was another member of staff, they probably wouldn't be allowing this. What are we doing out here? We have to as fast as we can. I'm pretty sure I'm past my union mandated bathroom break. I never should have had that second coffee. Dr. Shen, man, he is so cold. He literally has ice <laughs> running through his veins. I love working with doctors like him. They're just unflappable. And it's sad to say that many ER docs struggle and sort of burn out and have to leave the profession altogether. But you see a lot of people like Dr. Shen. And I think it's because this type of personality is the type of one that is able to get through it and able to stick it out. Hey, so an ER is closed, what's your injury? Oh, my oh, mom's just shit. Shit. That's the dude. Hey, Stop. Stop. What are you doing? Jesus Christ. I thought he was going to get away for a minute there. Stop the 1947. Right. Over the pits. Oh, Robbie, mate. But we were unable to get ahead of the massive blood loss. Her heart stopped. Absolutely heartbreaking. Yeah, what can you say? This is just... I mean, how much can one dude take? And an 18-year-old who, who was brain dead from a fentanyl overdose and a guy with a heart condition and a little girl who drowned trying to save her sister and I'm going to remember Leah long after you've forgotten her. Oh, fuck. Oh, man. <laughs> he has been absolutely hammered today and... I think we'd all, I think we'd all react in a similar way. So there you have it. Absolutely heartbreaking. I think in the last episode, we saw everyone rise to the challenge and it was quite awe-inspiring given the horrendous situation. But in this one, we saw more of the realities of the team kind of reaching capacity going beyond it and then seeing the toll it's having on them. Again, brilliantly done. And I said it in the last episode, but I say it again, hats off to anyone involved in this production for telling this story. And thank you for watching this far. If there's anything I've missed or anything you want to add, I love hearing your comments. And if you have enjoyed the video, please give it a like and subscribe too. It really does help me out. I hope you're all well and I'll be back soon.